Welcome to the Russian Rulers History Podcast, Episode 101. We will bury you, Nikita Sergeyevich. Back in Episode 99, we saw how close the world came to an all-out nuclear war caused by Khrushchev's decision to place missiles on the island nation of Cuba, close to American soil. The fallout from this was to accelerate the downfall of the Soviet leader. Note how I said accelerate and not begin the downfall. The reason is Khrushchev had already begun to lose prestige in the eyes of the fellow Central Committee members. They were growing tired of his tirades, and few knew the entirety of the concessions the Soviets received by pulling out of Cuba, like the removal of the Jupiter missiles out of Turkey by the United States. As Dubrinin put it, the compromise was to the Soviet Union, quote, a blow to its prestige bordering on humiliation. This is how many of the members of the Central Committee and the Presidium were feeling, although not publicly. Following the crisis, Khrushchev had to tell the Soviet people what had happened, and then he had to mollify his own party members. In their newspaper, Pravda, the people were told that Khrushchev's calm and wisdom was able to save humanity from nuclear catastrophe. To the Supreme Soviet Assembly of December 12, 1962, he gave an impassioned speech which he, in which he told the assembled members that the crisis showed that his actions had helped to prevent the invasion, and that they had overcome a crisis that threatened general thermonuclear war. Furthermore, the forces of peace and socialism had imposed peace. Reason triumphed, and the cause of peace and security of nations won. According to the man who helped edit the speech, Fyodor Burlatsky, he, quote, his face truly shone with happiness. It was not the face of a man who was suffering pangs of conscience or a feeling of guilt. No, it was the face of a man who had saved the world. There were still problems with the outcome, which made Khrushchev increasingly defensive. At a Central Committee meeting, he stated about the actions in Cuba, It was not necessary to act like a czarist officer who farted at the ball and then shot himself. Castro, for his part, was furious. He told an associate what he thought of Khrushchev, and mind you, this is a bit spicy. Son of a bitch. Bastard. Asshole. No cojones. Maricón. The Cuban leader also refused to allow inspections of Cuba, as Khrushchev and Kennedy agreed upon, unless five conditions were met, which included a halt to the American economic blockade, a pledge to discontinue any subversive plots against the government in Havana, no more flights, or naval spying and removal of the American military base at Guantanamo Bay. Obviously, none of these happened. Khrushchev decided that an emissary had to be sent to Cuba, and the only one he supposedly trusted, and that Castro trusted, was Mikoyan. Only problem was the fact that Anastas's wife, Ashken, was dying. What follows is truly one of the dark marks on Khrushchev's legacy. When Mikoyan hesitated about going, Khrushchev told him, quote, Anastas, if the worst comes to pass, we'll take care of everything. You don't need to worry. Well, he went, and Castro initially gave Mikoyan the cold shoulder, but during negotiations, his wife did die. Khrushchev gave Mikoyan the option to come home for the funeral, but he declined, sending his son Sergo back to Moscow. This greatly impressed Castro, who warmed up to the diplomat. Khrushchev from here, frankly, acted like a pig. Not only did he miss the wake for his comrade's late wife, he missed the funeral as well. He said to Sergo Mikoyan, who asked why he didn't show, Oh, after all, it's not like going to a wedding, is it? This was a slap in the face of his erstwhile ally. He further compounded the insult by telling Castro some time later, quote, I trust Mikoyan least of all. He's a shrewd fox from the east. 
You can't count on him. In both 1953, when we arrested Beria, and in 1957 with the anti-party group, I was more nervous about Mikoyan's position than anyone else's. Mikoyan never forgave Khrushchev for his actions and words. Because of his seemingly failed mission in Cuba, Khrushchev was never able to resolve any major foreign affair issue again. His normal policy was one of bluster and bluff. But that was taken away from him. He was like a lost boy without his favorite and only other toy. Now he had to focus on the numerous domestic problems facing the Soviet Union, with the main one being agriculture. His continuing support for the pseudoscientist Trofim Lysenko caused untold damage to the plans for increased output. Also, plans to radically change the Soviet economy by splitting the Communist Party into two separate pieces and writing a new constitution brought him no friends and began to alienate those comrades he helped into positions of power. Increasingly, he began to isolate himself away from Moscow. Never a good thing if you're having problems. But Khrushchev didn't think that anyone would plot against him. He was too sure of his position and had his spies. Unfortunately for him, many of his spies were also growing tired of his antics. As Taubman puts it in his wonderful biography of Khrushchev, quote, Yet as his miseries multiplied, he withdrew into an inner circle of personal aides and advisors, avoiding all his colleagues, acting without informing them and berating them in public and private for what they regarded as his sins. Khrushchev's entire foreign policy hopes stood on an agreement with the U.S. on a nuclear test ban, which would prove that his back down in Cuba could be translated into a substantive agreement with his capitalist foe. But despite numerous correspondences with Kennedy, nothing came of it as the Americans demanded 8 to 10 site inspections per year whereas the Soviets were only good with two or three. As Khrushchev put it, quote, back came the American rejection. They wanted neither three inspections nor even six. They wanted eight. And so, once again, I was made to look foolish. But I can tell you this, it won't happen again. After that, he became even more defensive in his speeches, like one he gave in East Germany in January of 1963. Some may say that time seems to have been wasted, that the socialist countries have gained nothing by posing the question of a German peace treaty so sharply. Some people who claim that Cuba and the Soviet Union suffered a defeat in the Caribbean conflict. Then Khrushchev got into it with his military advisors and leaders like Marshal Gretschko. Gretschko wanted more soldiers with longer service stints, as well as an increased investment in tactical missiles. Nikita snapped. Get back a couple of steps, will you? And don't try to convince me, because I have no money. We don't have enough under the mattress for everything. Malinovsky, the defense minister, complained as well about the lack of soldiers citing the low birth rate, especially in Russia post-World War II. Now, let me back off the story for a moment, So I want to touch on this issue of the low birth rate. Kanin, a Russian economist, pointed out the enormous population losses from World War I onward. The main losses, of course, were of young men, which caused the low birth rates of the 50s and 60s, as there were frankly not enough men to go around. But there's another factor. The lousy economy and the scarcity of consumer goods and food. Now, why bear numerous children you could ill afford to feed and clothe then? That was the reality in Khrushchev's Soviet Union. Now back to Malinovsky, Gretschko, and Khrushchev. To Malinovsky's request for more troops, Nikita responded, Who's serving whom? The army, the people? Or the people, the army? Has it ever occurred to you how many useful things are produced by young men during the third year they don't spend in the army? To Gretschko he shouted, You just don't understand. If you did, you wouldn't ask such a stupid question. It's not easy to think up something like that. 
We spend billions training needed specialists, and all you want to do is grab them away and make them goose step. Then Khrushchev made comments that made both men alarmed when he talked about cutting down dramatically on the army to a point where it would only become a people's militia. In March of 1963, he had secured making his enemies of the military. Now going back a bit to November of 1962, at a meeting of the Central Committee, Khrushchev's plan to split the Communist Party in two, one to deal with industry and the other with agriculture, was unanimously approved. But most of the members were deeply unhappy. As journalist Nikolai Barsukov said, not one good word about the new reorganization, only bewilderment and outright rejection. By April of 1963, Khrushchev had begun to blast the military, some more by calling them swindlers, thieves, and all kinds of filth that should be squashed like bugs. On novelists and poets, he said, they root around in the garbage can, dig out the garbage, and suck on it. As for writers, they went abroad, saw panties for their wives in colors we do not have here, and started sighing, Oh, that's America for you. They make better panties than we do. Then he really went off the deep end with the artistic community. At an exhibition in the capital entitled 30 Years of Moscow Art, Khrushchev went berserk. He looked at one painting and said, and this is pretty graphic, so if you have young ones listening, be prepared. It's dog shit. A donkey could smear better than this with his tail. You're a nice-looking lad, but how could you paint something like this? We should take down your pants and send you in a clump of nettles until you understand your mistakes. You should be ashamed. Are you a faggot or a normal man? Do you want to go abroad? Go then. We'll take you as far as the border. We have a right to send you out to cut trees until you've paid them back the money the state has spent on you. The people and the government have taken a lot of trouble with you, and you pay them back with this shit. It only got worse. In December of 1962, Khrushchev went after a group of artists and writers in a two-hour tirade that could only be described as bizarre, and afterwards he constantly interrupted other speakers, much to the horror of fellow Presidium members who were gathered in the hall. An example of his tirade was pointed at artist Nevzvestny. Your art resembles this. It's as if a man climbed into a toilet, slid down under the seat, and from there, from under the toilet seat, looked up at what was above him. It's someone sitting on the seat, looking up at what was above him from below, from under the seat. That is what your art is like. That is your position, comrade Nevzvestny. You're sitting in the toilet. So now the intelligentsia, military, and most of the Communist Party were beginning to realize that Khrushchev had to go. But how? On March 7, 1963, Khrushchev got even angrier at a function in front of 600 people, including Presidium members. A calm speech had been prepared for Nikita, but he pushed it aside. All volunteer informers for foreign agencies, I ask you to leave the hall. I know, you just can't get up now and give yourselves away. So during the break, when we're in the cafeteria, you just pretend to go to the toilet and then get lost. You understand? His paranoia was beginning to develop into something debilitating and embarrassing to the party. Then Khrushchev went on a tirade against poet Andrei Vojnozhensky, who had praised author Boris Pasternak of Dr. Zhivago fame. Slander, slander, slander! Who do you think you are? Your view of Soviet power is from inside a toilet. If you don't like it here, you can go to hell. We're not keeping you. Get yourself a passport and I'll approve it in two minutes. Is Gromyko here? He is? Approve his passport and let him get the hell out. When Vojnozhensky turned to look at Khrushchev, he noted, quote, his eyes rolling and saliva flying. He looked insane, hysterical, as if he was having a seizure. 
The poet tried to read a poem about Lenin when Khrushchev interrupted and said, It's good for nothing. You can't write, and you don't know anything. Here's a question for you. How many people are born in the Soviet Union every year? Three and a half million. So you, comrade, Vojnozhensky, you're nothing. You're only one of three and a half million, one who won't amount to anything. You can carve it on your nose. You are nothing. The only thing that can help you is a little modesty. Success has gone to your head. You were born a prince. When I was 29 years old, I was a responsible person. But you're irresponsible. These seemingly endless tirades were the straw that broke the camel's back, so to say, with the Presidium members. Quietly, they began to talk about how they were going to get rid of Khrushchev. We're not sure when the planning began, but it was happening as early as 1962. But not all was bad, as Khrushchev made inroads to resolve the animosity between him and Castro. When the Cuban leader came to the Soviet Union in late April of 1963, Nikita feted Fidel and had him stay for a month and a half. He had his translator read the correspondence between himself and Kennedy during the Cuban Missile Crisis, which made Castro satisfied with what had happened. Khrushchev kept the prospect of detente with the United States, but that was dealt a blow with the assassination of President Kennedy and the installment of Lyndon Johnson to the presidency. Nikita considered Johnson to be a war hawk and not one to negotiate with. Next up was trying to repair relations with China, but that failed miserably with both sides throwing accusations and insults at each other. With the Chinese attacking Khrushchev, his fellow Presidium and Central Party Committee members had to back him, delaying his ouster. There were still disagreements by party leaders over Nikita's handling of the soyano soviet conflict, and it was beginning to come out in the open, but slowly. Then, as if to continue the pileup of bad news, the harvest of 1963 was a complete and utter disaster. The harvest was so bad the Soviet Union had to buy over 10 million tons of grain from countries like Canada and the United States. It was driving Khrushchev crazy. As his son Sergei said, father didn't understand what was wrong. He grew nervous, became angry, quarreled, looked for culprits, and didn't find them. Deep inside, he began subconsciously to understand that the problem was not in the details. It was the system itself that didn't work, but he couldn't change his beliefs. There's a general consensus when reading history that many of the plots that succeed in overthrowing someone comes when they spend too much time away from their base of power. Khrushchev did just that in 1963 and 1964, spending over half his time away from Moscow. In 1964, two trips were of pretty substantial nature one to Egypt to celebrate the opening of the Aswan Dam, and the other to Scandinavia. But the real end began on October 3, 1964, when Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev decided now was a good time for a vacation. It was the worst possible time. For the past year and a half, men like Leonid Brezhnev, Alexei Kosygin, Alexander Shalepin, KGB chief Vladimir Semichastny, Nikolai Podgorny, and others had begun to plot Khrushchev's overthrow. There was one plan to have him arrested after he returned from Scandinavia, but they were wary that he could pull another miracle out of his hat like he did when the anti-party group had underestimated him. They needed to get enough support from the Central Committee members to guarantee his ouster. Khrushchev kept having people close to him, like his son Sergei and daughter Rada, tell him that a plot to overthrow him was afoot. But Nikita didn't believe them. He confronted one of the plotters, who denied everything, so he told his son, Evidently what you told me is nonsense. I was leaving the Council of Ministers with Mikoyan and Podgorny, and I summarized your story in a couple of words. Podgorny simply laughed at me. How can you think such a thing, Nikita Sergeyevich? Those were his exact words. Sergei, for his part, found his father's line of logic strange, illogical, and inexplicable. 
He questioned. Did he expect to evoke a con confession? He had been guilty of naivete at times in the past, but never in a situation like this. Still, Khrushchev began to suspect things, as he once called fellow Presidium member Dmitry Polyansky, and asked him what was going on in Moscow, and said he would fly back immediately to find out. The members of the coup knew they had to act, and act quickly. On October 12th, Leonid Brezhnev called Khrushchev while Nikita and Mikoyan were on an evening walk. Brezhnev told Khrushchev that the Presidium had called a special meeting for the next day. The following conversation supposedly occurred per Taubman's biography on Khrushchev. Why? Khrushchev demanded. On what issue? On agriculture and some others, Brezhnev explained. Decide things without me, Khrushchev ordered curtly. We can't decide without you. Members have already gathered. We're asking you to come. I'm on vacation. What could be so urgent? I'll be back in two weeks and we'll discuss it then. After a pause, Khrushchev continued. I don't understand any of this. What do you mean you all got together? We'll be discussing agricultural questions at the November plenum. There'll be plenty of time to talk about everything. Brezhnev convinced Khrushchev to come. The old man knew what was up, and he told Mikoyan while they walked. You know, Anastas, they haven't got any urgent agricultural problems. I think the call is connected with what Sergei was telling us. At this point, you have to wonder why Khrushchev allowed things to get this far, and to be honest, I truly believe that he wanted to retire and leave the role of head of state behind. He had talked about retirement, but didn't know how to do it. He was tired, had grown grumpy in his old age, and wasn't the man he was once. His energy was gone. It was time, so he didn't fight it. When his plane touched down in Moscow on October 13th, he was met by Semachastny and three others. Glad you've arrived safely, Nikita Sergeyevich, said the head of the KGB. They've all gathered at the Kremlin. They're waiting for you. All Khrushchev could say, looking at Mikoyan, was, Let's go, Anastas. In his heart, he knew the jig was up. Khrushchev went into the meeting demanding to know what was up, so Brezhnev jumped up and laid into Nikita for contradicting Lenin's teachings and treating his colleagues rudely, ignoring his fellow Presidium members when making decisions. Your behavior is incomprehensible, Brezhnev said to his mentor. Khrushchev tried to defend himself, but was shot down immediately by Gennady Voronov, who said, You have no friends here. Voronov laid into Khrushchev, followed by Alexander Shelepin, then Andrei Kirilenko, and the Belarusian party boss Kirill Mazurov. Mikhail Suzlov said, Nikita Sergeyevich, you don't even understand how far you've allowed this to go. You don't listen to anyone. You say party officials have hindered agricultural development, when it's you who's messed everything up. You listen to too much from your family members, especially to Ajubai. You take family members abroad with you. As a result of your foreign trips, we end up arguing with our foreign friends. Our press is too full of Khrushchev this, Khrushchev that, and there are too many pictures of you. We must put an end to this. The meeting was called to an end, and Khrushchev went back home to his home on the Lenin Hills. He told his son, everything happened just the way you said it would. Don't ask any questions. I'm tired, and I have to think. A little while later, he called Mikoyan and said, I'm old and tired. Let them cope by themselves. I've done the main thing. Could anyone have dreamed of telling Stalin that he didn't suit us any more and suggesting we retire? Not even a wet spot would have remained where we had been standing. Now everything is different. The fear is gone, and we can talk as equals. That's my contribution. I won't put up a fight. The next morning at 10 a.m., the Presidium members continued to lay into Khrushchev in earnest. First up was Dmitry Polyansky, followed by Nikita's old friend Mikoyan, 
who, while hard on him, did request that he remain as prime minister, but that was shot down immediately. Alexei Kasigin rose to tell us soon to be ex-boss, You're an honest man, but you've set yourself up in opposition to the Presidium. You don't pay attention to anyone. You don't hear anyone out. You interrupt everyone. You love ovations. You're constantly involved with intrigues, putting down one man, toying with another. The next two to put down Khrushchev were supposed to be rivals, Nikolai Podgorny and Leonid Brezhnev. They put forth further arguments against Nikita, but it was all over. A vote to end the debate and oust Khrushchev was passed unanimously. Then Nikita, looking as Schlest remembered, crushed, isolated, powerless, arose to speak one last time. All of you spoke a lot about my negative characteristics and actions, but you also mentioned my positive qualities, and I thank you for that. I'm happy for the Presidium, for its maturity. A grain of my work, too, helped to create that maturity. Forgive me my rudeness. A lot of what you described I don't remember, but I admit that I manifested weakness, and then it became a habit and my high position turned my head. I'm accused of combining the posts of First Secretary of the General Committee and Chairman of the Council of Ministers. Well, I tried not to take both, but you yourselves gave them to me, and I made the mistake of agreeing. It's a mistake to combine them. I made an error in not raising this issue at the 22nd Congress. I could already see and understand that the load was too great for me. These aren't tears of self-pity. The battle with Stalin's cult of personality was a big one, and I made a small contribution. You've already decided everything. I'll do what's best for the party. I understand that my role doesn't exist anymore, but if I were you, I wouldn't dismiss me entirely. I don't intend to speak at the plenum. I'm not going to ask for mercy. The issue is decided. As I told Mikoyan, I'm not going to resist. I'm not about to smear you. After all, you and I hold the same views. I'm upset, but I'm also glad that the party has gotten to the point that it can rein in even its first secretary. You call this a cult? You smeared me all over with shit, and I said, You're right. You call that a cult? I've been thinking for a long time that it's time for me to go, but it's hard to let go. I myself could see that I wasn't coping with my responsibilities, that I wasn't meeting with any of you. I cut myself off from you. You've really let me have it for doing so, but no more than I suffered over this myself. I never played dice or pool, as so many of my colleagues did. I was always working. I thank you for the opportunity you've given me to retire. I ask you write me a suitable statement and I'll sign it. I'm ready to do anything in the interests of the party. I've been a party member for 46 years. So please understand me. I thought that maybe you'd think it possible to create some sort of honorary position for me, but I'm not asking you to do so. As for where I'll live, decide that yourselves. If you insist, I'll leave Moscow and go wherever you want. The next day, Brezhnev opened the Central Committee meeting to discuss the charges against Khrushchev. Suzlov read a note from Nikita asking to be allowed to resign, citing age and health issues. Unanimously, the resolution to let Khrushchev retire was approved, as was the motions to elect Brezhnev as First Party Secretary and Kosygin as Prime Minister. Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev had been the first Russian or Soviet leader to walk away from power alive. That is, unless you believe that Alexander I did so in 1825 to become a monk. Aside from that rumor, only Gorbachev and Khrushchev have walked away from the leadership post. And we can only presume that Putin will too. 
The evening of his ouster saw Mikoyan visit him with news about his retirement. Your pension will be set at 500 rubles a month, and you'll have a car. It was suggested that you remain a deputy of the Supreme Soviet, although a final decision on that hasn't been taken. I also suggested setting up a post of consultant to the Presidium for you. But that was rejected, said Mikoyan. Khrushchev replied, There was no need to. They'd never agree to that. Why would they want me around after everything that's happened? Of course, it would be nice to have something to do. I don't know how I'll be able to live in retirement doing nothing. But it was a mistake to propose that. Thanks anyway. It's good to know you have a friend at your side. That friend would never see Khrushchev again. Nikita Sergeyevich would live out his retirement in increasingly smaller places as the government basically had him under house arrest until his death in 1971. He would suffer from depression and ill health, but he was able to dictate his memoirs, which helped this podcast series of his life. It's a fascinating read and well worth getting. Join me next time as we begin telling the tale of the next head of the Soviet Union in Russia, Leonid Brezhnev. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. If you enjoy the series, please rate me on iTunes to move me up the history podcast list. Also, join us on Facebook at the Russian Rulers History Podcast Group, where you can join us and learn more about Russian history, or where you can leave a message, make a comment, or ask a question. So now... As always, das vidanya is pasiba bolshoya.